Morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> follow that. Um, that. That's a hard job, actually, so I'll do my best, particularly as I've got five minutes less than I thought I had, so I'm going to have to rattle through a bit. Um, I'll just start by talking about Juliet, and then we'll get into the, the implications of what we learned. It's not, she's not really called Juliet, but it'll, it'll do. Um, Juliet was in trouble. Uh, she's got, she had a huge council tax debt, massive rent arrears, just lots of other debts. Um, single mum with an 11-year-old boy who's about to go to secondary school. And she told us she was depressed and she'd had long-term mental health problems. She was worried about antisocial behaviour in her estate and she was scared stiff of the neighbour. Um, she'd been referred to... We counted about 14 different organisations but hadn't taken any of them up because it was just too overwhelming. So she hid. And the debt grew and grew and grew. Um, the, uh, her boy was about to start secondary school. That, that, this was in the summer. We were talking to her. And um, she couldn't afford any of the bus fare or the transport. And she'd hidden from any opportunities to get help with it. And she didn't want him walking half an hour to school and back every day. She was worried about him. And she was worried about being able to afford his uniform. He picked up on her worries. And his behavior started to worsen and was becoming this awful phrase on the, you know, known to services. So that's an interesting thing. I don't think they knew anything. Um, and she gave us a bit of a description, which I won't repeat here, but you can fill in the gaps. Um, but what we actually knew about Juliet was that she had debt. That's all we knew as a, as, a, as a local authority. So we chased her for the debt. So we sent her a letter saying, you owe us some money. Then we sent her another one. And then we threatened action. Then we took action. And we decided we'd seen enough for this. So I, I run a, a, a small team that's trying to do big things. Um, and we decided that we were going to intercept the bailiff and we would go instead. So we decided to use the debt as a trigger. So we rang Julia and we said, look, we know you're in debt, but we're not chasing you for the money. Just, just how are you? And she burst into tears and said, no one's asked me that for years. Um, we got to know her situation. We had a small team. So we had somebody from DWP in the room who had access to all of the IT, who said your benefits are way out. Uh, more on that later. Um, so her debt was climbing unnecessarily. She had rent arrears, so she couldn't move because she was in a council property. Because the, the rule is, if you've got arrears, you can't move. So she was trapped. Um, we decided that was a stupid rule when we moved her. And we, got, we helped her to move. Uh, we helped with the uniform. We spent some money. Um, we got CAB involved, who were brilliant. Um, we, her sister lived near the school, and she'd hidden from her sister. Her sister was worried sick about her, but no, nobody knew about this. So what we, we ended up doing is, because she, um, she had two jobs, both zero-hours contracts, and she had to give one of them up because her mother wouldn't come and help look after the little one at night because they were scared of the neighbour. That's the reason she was in debt. So if we'd have taken any time to understand that, we might have done something about it. So the police got involved... Um, and everybody worked really well. Now we've moved her. She's taken her job back up. She's training. She's got some confidence. Child settled down okay. He's not known to services anymore. And we got fan mail. So who's we? This isn't how the council normally operates, nor the CAB, nor the DWP. What we are is we decided to set up a small team just to grow a self-managed approach. I'm in awe of the previous presentation. This is a very... Um, uh, pound shop version of it. it. We really are at the beginning. And what we decided to do was just to liberate a team. So we've got a council tax expert, a benefits expert, a um, private sector housing expert, and we got somebody from the, uh, the, housing, the housing company. And we said, as long as you don't break the law and do any damage, you can do what you like. And we gave them some money. They didn't really spend very much on sorting that out. 90 quid, bit of uniform, some bits and bobs, and a bit of attention, and a lot of care, and a lot of love, actually. Juliet's a friend now. So it's interesting that all the models of intervention were thrown out the window. Chasing the debt was futile, um, and yet we have a debt collection system predicated on people's unwillingness to pay. So this gave us an idea that we were going to do this more. We thought that was a bit of a result. So... One of the illusions that we had to kind of shatter was that there was a choice between dealing with inequality and saving money. They're the same problem. 
But for years, we were thought there were different problems. You know, we have less money, so we have to make the criteria tougher. So if people are wobbling and threatening to go into crisis, well, sorry, we're going to have to strip it back to those that were already in crisis. So guess what happens to the wobblers? They go into crisis, and we wonder why demand goes up. So we think there's a, not as neat as this, but there's a bit of a linear relationship between demand and thriving. So the more people that thrive, the less demand into core services. That's what we're working on. And it's interesting that the, the elected members love this. That, that concept, it's the officers that are struggling because they want to control things. So we're having a bit of a difficulty with that. Now, I won't go into those numbers specifically, but what we really want to do is just move this to there. So we're going to do some work that basically takes us from a position where there's high demand and not much thriving going on to the opposite. So we're not really looking introspectively at services. We're looking at people. We're getting to know people and communities. So there's different ways you can do change. And this is one of my cheesy diagrams, as my team referred to them. Um, there's basically a, a relationship between the type of problem that you have and the, the way that you try to solve it. And, broad, and none of these are bad or good. This is just it's about applying the right thing to the right thing. So what we're finding is that there's a bunch of things that we could um, do a bit better. Uh, we could get a bit of efficiency out. We could perhaps create some capacity. But the problem is reform work was often seen as, as taking something we do and doing it more efficiently. Um, but if it's, uh, you know, many of you know the wrong thing, right a quote, well, there's an awful lot of that going on. And there was very little patience to do work that took a while to set up. If you look at that reform bit, the lead time before you start seeing benefits is quite considerable. It sort of tracks along the bottom. And I found one of the challenges that I talked about on the table, there's no patience to invest in work like that because we've got firefighting and improvement to do. So the program I'm running is doing the green stuff. I don't really care about the red and yellow. I'm not interested. Other people are doing that. You can crack on. So, so what we're doing is essentially three phases, and I'm going to rattle through this a bit. So the first phase we've just finished. We don't care how efficient it is. We got that group of people together and we said... Go knock it out of the park. Go and help people. So when the bailiff's about to turn up, you go instead. So we took council tax as a signal, the debt as a signal, and we didn't assume anything. We just rocked up and said, hello, um, we know you're in debt, but we're not after the money. And guess what? People were really interested in talking to us. Um, apart from what was interesting, actually, is we'd, we sometimes we rang people up and said, we can see you've got a debt, but we're not chasing you for it. Um, we're trying to help you. And they'd hang up, and the switchboard would get a call. I've had a bogus call from the, um, you know, council in helpfulness shocker. Um, so we had to alert the switchboard to that. Uh, but we wanted to learn, let's just learn how to be effective. Let's get the method right, and we'll worry about making it efficient later on, and we'll worry about the governance later on. How many of you have been involved in projects or programs where question one is, right, we need to get the governance sorted out? Couldn't give a stuff. We'll get on to that in a bit. So we just need to know what it is we wish to govern before we govern anything, and even whether we should govern anything. So what we want to do next is, yes, we need to take up the efficiency question. So let's work out what the teams need to look like. I've already learned a ton this morning, just listening to the presentation, and I've been stalking um, our previous speakers for a little while. Um, what are those roles and what are those processes? Um, and then, so we're going to test that using, of all places, a library. People walk into the library and sit down at those computers and they don't want a book. Half of them want work. So we're going to work with people that walk into the library. So we're using more signals. The council tax data is one signal. We want to use more. So that fleshes our method out, but it gives us some, um, some confidence as well. And we're going to develop a role, not, I hope, not unlike the roles we've heard about already. Well, I'm calling a generalist, but I want a better job title than that. Uh, and then those people are just going to be able to do stuff, not just refer stuff on. And then we're going to do this in a community. We're getting some lottery money, hopefully, find out tomorrow. And we're going to do this in terms of governance, the community work, and everything. We're going to go to the most deprived community in Gateshead and work with our partners to do everything from scratch. Again, I could talk for hours on that. And then we make an informed choice. Do we want to make this normal everywhere? So there's a bunch of questions that we're going to ask. I won't go through them now because I haven't got time. Um, so basically, what did we do in our little prototype? Well, we did a bunch of things. So we, looked, we got a small team together. We agreed some basic principles, things like you don't refer this person on, you pull people that we need to this person. 
Uh, we don't give up on anybody. You make the decisions. If you struggle to make the decision, we'll help you, but you still make the decision. We're building a network. We're not interested in referral pathways, and we definitely don't do assessments. How much of what we do can we do to you? That's not a great question. What does a good life for you look like? How might we help you with that? That's a better question. Okay, I've been given a bit of a warning. I'm really sorry I'm not going to be able to do this in a minute, but I'm going to rattle through. We're going to talk a little bit about Mary. Um, Mary, basically, we found her sat alone in a chair with, no, with loads of layers on, no heating and one light source. Um, and we spent 1,600 quid and lots and lots and lots of visits turning her life around. The GP was convinced she'd have died and we didn't do anything technical. All we did is we found her we understood that she'd been, she was being financially abused. The police were brilliant as soon as they got wind of it. And lot, again, I won't elaborate, but we've, we did lots of simple things autonomously. And I would say we saved her life. So I'm going to rattle through, but what we did in the prototype is we worked with 40 people. 15 of them, interestingly, from the council tax signal. But what, guess what happened? You know, just think about if you were in an organisation and you got wind of this. People started ringing us up. Now, if you've ever been in charge of change initiatives, normally people run away from you. Oh, God, it's the change people. Um, but what we were getting were calls saying, Can we, we've got a case. You know, and basically, we took other people on. 30 of the 40 that we helped had a lots, of, lots of tangled up problems, but not the single problem that was holding them back, just lots of cumulative threads that were holding them back. Six of them indeed had big problems and we needed expert help. And if we didn't untangle the big problem, we wouldn't get anywhere with the little one. So really severe mental health issues, that sort of thing. Um, we found, I'm actually going to skip to this one, because this is the key slide, and then I promise I'll get off the stage. Um, we learned a bunch of things by working holistically with people and suspending all the rules apart from the law. And what we learned is that signals are a brilliant opportunity to save a lot of money. But we tend to work with triggers, we wait for things to happen. We need wait for things to hit the fan before we do anything about it. But we have knowledge and we have intelligence, not just data. It's what we see, what we hear, and what the numbers tell us. Give us places to go. So we're going to work out which doors to knock on. We don't know a problem until we know its context. So, it's, I mean, this is critical. We knew that um, Juliet had a debt, but we didn't know anything about it. So we just chased it, and that was just going to get worse. Critically, and this is a bit Hillary Cotton-esque, relationships were what solved the problems, not the services, not the hierarchies. So we were lectured by, I'm not going to say which profession, um, by a lot of people in, with an orthodoxy that we were breaching boundaries. We were, they were, we were building too close a relationship with people. No, what we were doing was we were understanding them, and they were understanding us. And that meant we could solve problems. And what's interesting, and if, if, it's, if from all this rapid garble, if you remember one thing, it's the next one. It's not that compassion and empathy sometimes leads to innovation. It, autumn, it just does every single time. If you allow somebody to get to know somebody and to care about them, they will come up, systematically come up with inventive and creative things. That's the key thing the team said. If you're going to this fancy thing in London, say that and don't say anything else. So that's what I'm going to say. Um, the, the thing I would follow on from that is it has implication for commissioning. Toby will talk about this later, I know. But most of what we did was small, basic, easy. A brew, a gym pass, a bus pass. We got short shrift. You can't just give that stuff away. Well, 90 quid for Juliet went quite far, I thought. Um, we need to rethink what we mean by control and by leadership. So, and the, and the previous speakers did a better job than I could about that. The other thing I would say, again, I will, I'm really trying to hurry is that um, there's three types of interaction that we were finding that people have been subjected to. They're either intervened with, we know best, um, transacted with, here's a thing that we've got in bulk, we hope you like it, uh, and the thing in the middle, support, we're going to understand you and your nuances and your idiosyncrasies and your context. Austerity has butchered that middle one. It's butchered it because it's not statutory and it's not cheap. So the top, the top one and the bottom one have survived pretty much to a degree, but the support stuff, the system is weakest where it needs to be strongest, basically. So what we were doing is just reintroducing support, and it wasn't difficult, it wasn't technical. And we found that most of the people that we worked with had a better life, having spent years of having a terrible one. 
I'm not going to dwell on the efficiency point. I think most of the people know that if we dwell on efficiency, we miss effectiveness. And final point, this has been hard. I've had a lot of scraps. I've had a lot of things thrown at me. Um, in it, the things that we did were really simple. It, day one, we got the team together, briefed them in the morning. By the time they'd done the afternoon, they'd taken two cases on and helped them. Didn't take long for them to pick it up because it was simple. But culturally, dynamite. And you have to have thick skin and a lot of friends. So I've got the thick skin. I'm working on the friends. But, um, but it is really important. Where, and you do, previous speaker said this, you have to be brave and you have to put up with a lot of crap. Um, so surround yourself with people that can help you because it will, it will be rocky. And my final slide, six points which I'd like to talk to the room about later, but I won't dwell on now. These are the questions that we don't have answers to. So I'll leave it there um, because I'm feeling like I'm well overdue. But... Uh, Thanks for your attention and enjoy the day.